Now we're gonna move on to panel number three, which is going to examine a best interest standard of care. Is it right for Canada? Our moderator for this uh, panel is Preet Banerjee, who is a Globe and Mail columnist, the host of Million Dollar Neighborhood, and a bottom line panelist on The National. Pete, uh, uh, Preet was originally uh, trained as a neuroscientist at the University of Toronto before joining the financial services industry. Uh, previously as an advisor in both the MFDA and the IROC channels, he is currently serves as a W Network money expert and he writes a personal finance column in the Globe and Mail and he is the writer behind the award-winning investment blog where does all my money go dot com which incidentally was voted Canada's best investment blog in 2010 by readers of the Globe and Mail. He's also the author of retirement uh, RRSPs, the Definitive Guide to Registered Retirement Savings Plans and Charitable Giving Strategies for Canadians. Formerly, as I said, a stockbroker, a financial planner, a life license insurance advisor with a Bay Street firm, Banerjee has also worked as an institutional investment sales and product development for an index fund manufacturer. Advisor.ca named Preet one of Canada's top financial visionaries in 2011. He hosts a podcast on iTunes, Mostly Money, Mostly Canadian, which is one of the highest rated podcasts in Canada for business and investing. Preet, would you please come forward and introduce our panelists? Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Um, I guess I'll take the uh, direction of the other moderators and sit right in the middle. Uh, now, I think we have one panelist who has yet to actually show up, so I'm going to bide some time here by providing the uh, issue overview before we get started. Um, Canada's securities regulators are considering implementing a statutory best interest duty for advisors and dealers. In the consultation paper they released just over one year ago, they cited their reasons behind this initiative, including concerns about the financial literacy of consumers, possible expectation gaps between advisors and clients, and the potential for conflicts of interest. At the same time, the CSA acknowledged the complexity of this issue, noting the lack of consensus on many of its key aspects, such as what the duty encompasses, when it should apply, and whether the current regulatory regime is already functionally equivalent to a best interest standard. While some industry observers have stated that a statutory duty is the best way to protect consumers, others have commented that it could result in adverse consequences for both advisors and clients by driving up costs and creating uncertainty that will result in litigation. The interplay between a statutory best interest duty for securities and the insurance sector's utmost good faith standard is also unclear, especially as consumers often purchase both products from one point of sale through their advisor. But with foreign jurisdictions such as the United Kingdom, United States and Australia implementing their own best interest standards, there may be pressure for Canada to follow suit. Given this complicated landscape, this panel will debate whether a statutory best interest duty is right for Canada. So at this time, I will now introduce the panelists, starting with, ah, Anita's here. <laughs> Come on down. Anita is a professor at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law. She is the academic director of the Center for the Legal Profession, including its program on ethics in law and business. Her main research areas relate to the regulation of capital markets and include a focus on corporate and securities law, as well as the ethics and the corporation. She was the inaugural chair of the Ontario Securities Commission's Investor Advocacy Panel from 2010 to 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, Anita Anand. Hey, John. John DeGuy. John is a Vice President and Associate Portfolio Manager with Bergenvest Big Securities Limited. He enjoys a national reputation as an authority on professional, uh, transparent financial advice in Canada. A frequent commentator on financial matters, John has written for a number of media sources, including the Globe and Mail and the National Post, and has made numerous appearances on television programs such as CBC's Marketplace and CTV's Canada AM. In 2003, John released his groundbreaking book, The Professional Financial Advisor. He is one of only 50 Canadians to be recognized as a fellow of the FPSC for his con contribution to the advancement of financial planning. Ladies and gentlemen, John DeGuy. Jeff Hyland. Jeff is Assistant Vice President and Senior Counsel with Great West Life. He has provided in-house legal advice in the life insurance and securities field since 1986. 
He is currently responsible for the legal team providing services to the Wealth Management Division of Great West Life, London and Canada Life, Quadris Investment Services, and GLC Asset Management. Jeff has spoken at a number of industry events over the years. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Highland. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, Laura Paglia. Laura is a partner at Tories LLP who has practiced exclusively in a variety of securities litigation and regulatory matters throughout her entire legal career. She has represented numerous investment fund dealers, advisors, portfolio managers, compliance professionals, industry associations, and other market participants. So basically everyone. <laughs> Laura has represented clients in civil and regulatory proceedings before provincial securities commissions, the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, and the Mutual Fund Dealers Association of Canada, the Crown and Federal Criminal Authorities. Ladies and gentlemen, Laura Paglia. So at this time, before we start with the moderated discussion, we're going to have the opening remarks, and I just want to use this time to remind people that if you have specific questions, please feel free to write them down, hold your hand up, and a member of the staff will collect your questions and we'll use that for the last 15 minutes of this panel so you can ask all the questions that you like. And I guess in order of uh, presentation, we'll start with the opening remarks. So Anita, if you will. Well, thank you very much, Preet, and thanks so much to Advocates for having me here today. I want to start by just mentioning that I don't have bounded loyalties. I'm not uh, representing an investor organization and I'm not representing an issuer or a dealer's uh, association in any form. So I'm, I'm here really in my capacity as uh, an expert in securities law, someone who teaches and researches in that area. So the first point I want to make is that the law on this issue is unduly complicated and convoluted. The standard is cobbled together from provincial securities regulations, common law principles, industry requirements. So it is difficult to say when a fiduciary duty or best interest standard applies without evaluating each relationship on a case by case basis, which often requires a full trial in and of itself. And so regardless of the outcome of our discussion here today, I want to make the point that the law is due up for clarification. Legislation should, in my view, be set forth to outline what the standard is so that there's more certainty in the law so that investors and advisors alike can turn to one place to determine the relevant standard of conduct. My second point is that investment advisors are in a unique position in that they have steward chip over the assets of their clients. And in, the, in this respect, they're similar to other professionals in our society that have stewardship over financial assets. Think about the directors of a corporation. The board has a duty, a statutory duty, to act honestly and in good faith and in the best interest of the corporation. That's their duty. They have the duty to abide by this standard set forth in legislation. Lawyers themselves have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of their clients. And recent case law in Strother from the Supreme Court of Canada says that this standard, this obligation, extends beyond the lawyer-client relationship, that it extends even when that relationship has been formally terminated. So the question that I'm coming here today to ask really is why investment advisors should be different from others in our society who are held to that standard. Why is it that they as individuals who have control over the assets, the financial assets of investors should somehow not be held to a best interest or fiduciary duty standard. And I'm open-minded, so I'm not here with that, um, with the answer to that specific question, but I would be interested to hear why not. And then thirdly, some argue that imposing a uniform fiduciary standard will increase the costs of providing advice, negatively impacting certain business models. And I think it's true that more stringent regulations, just as a general matter, carry greater compliance costs, and that some of these costs may be passed on to investors. 
but I'd like to put forward the claim that investors pay a price for invest investments that may not be in their best interests, especially given that the current standard falls short of a fiduciary standard. I believe that most investors would be willing to pay up front a higher cost for the imposition of an explicit fiduciary duty standard that requires their advisors to place the client's interest ahead of their own in all circumstances. And that brings me to the definition of fiduciary duty, something which some might start out with but that I'll end with. In my view, a fiduciary duty is a legal best interest standard. It's fairly similar to what a lay person would think. It includes acting honestly, in good faith, and putting the client's interest first. And many people, including people on this panel, will say, well, that standard is already adhered to by at least a majority of individuals in this profession. And I don't doubt that. What I'm saying is let's make it explicit and clear for the benefit of the market. Thank you, Anita. Uh, and uh, next, uh, John, your comments, please. Thanks. Uh, Preet, I, I guess I will also say what Anita said. Uh, uh, you know, the views that you're about to hear are my own. They're not necessarily those of my employers, so you know, don't, don't hold that against them. Uh, the other thing that I uh, would like to begin with is to get a sense of, um, well, the other thing that you should all know is that unlike the other um, panelists, I am A, not a lawyer, and B, a practicing uh, advisor. And so that gives me a bit of a different perspective, which I think is why I was invited to participate here today. So when studies are done and when polls are commissioned uh, with ordinary Canadians, and ordinary Canadians are asked if financial advisors are currently ask, uh, acting in their best interests, um, over 80% of Canadians are of the uh, view that advisors are in fact acting in their best interest. So we have a majority in both instances. Uh, clients think they're getting it already, advisors think they're providing it already, and yet as Anita has pointed out, there's this great gap in terms of the lack of certitude as to exactly where the line's being drawn and whether or not it in fact exists. So because I am not a lawyer, I don't want to purport to you know, know exactly what the law is, but as a layperson who read the uh, the CSA paper and commented on it. Uh, my understanding is that the idea of uh, whether or not a fiduciary relationship existed looking backward in a non-discretionary environment can only be determined by looking at the facts of the case. So what I'm, what I'm wondering about is to the extent that there might be a lack of sophistication or a reliance, the, to, the more that those things are, are present, the more is the likelihood that the court would, def would uh, determine after the fact that a fiduciary relationship existed for liability purposes. So here's the question. If most of you think you're doing it anyway, and most Canadians think they're getting it anyway, what's the big deal? Seems to me that there's a consensus that if, if I were to ask you, if I were to give you a polygraph uh, test and say, are you acting in your client's best interest? More, most of you would say, well, yeah, I am. And the clients think that that's the case as well, which is perhaps to your credit, but there's this presumptive gap where people think they're getting something which based on common law is not necessarily in the case. In fact, it is usually not the case. As Anita was, has pointed out, uh, the current uh, uh, standard of law, duty of care is one of acting fairly honestly and in good faith, which means you have to make recommendations that are broadly suitable, but not necessarily in the client's best interest. So let me uh, you know, give you an example. Anyone here who is working as a captive who can only recommend their company's products. I personally am doubtful that every single product that you have on your shelf, which again is limited to your company provider, can pass the test of being in your client's best interests unambiguously in all cases. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I don't know how, again, I don't know how to, how to draw the line, but I think there are things that need to be drawn out and need to be clearly explained. So I'm, I'm sort of making my original comments by uh, putting some comments out there, but I'm, I'm asking us all here to reconcile the gap between what people think is the case and what the current law says. How can we come together on this? Thanks. Thank you, John. And uh, next, Jack. Well, I'm going to join the club and say, hey, it's just my opinion, not my company. And for those of you in the audience who don't like Great West, I also provide legal advice to London Life. And if you don't like London Life, I provide legal advice to Canada Life and basically uh, anybody else that Great West Life owns from time to time. Um, I'm here, as I said, what I'm going to say is going to be my own opinion. I see this as an issue of who, when did you stop beating your wife? How do you say no to a best interest standard? Of course, 
all of us think that it's important that if you're providing financial advice to a client, you do so in their own best interest. If you don't do it, you're really acting at your own, uh, to your own prejudice. Um, I do think, I read the paper, I had the honor, well, dubious honor, dubious pleasure last week of reading every submission that was made to the CSA under this thing. Um, some of them I went through quickly, others I went through in more detail. I was really looking to see, because there are so many different opinions on this, I was really looking to see what, where are the threads, where are people coming from, where are the, for lack of a better word, agendas, what are people really trying to get, get at here. I read the paper, it's well written paper, but it's a bit muddy in a number of areas I found, and I had to make notes, and if I grab these, bear with me, I'm sort of halfway between blind and not blind. Um, there are issues there where people, people don't know, I, or at least have different understandings of what fiduciary duty means, and certainly, I think everybody has a different idea of what best interest means, or at least has their own idea of what it means, and other people have a very different idea. That way, I think, lies madness, and I think that's the core of the problem we're gonna have with this debate. <clears throat> a lot of the papers talked about serious issues with current fee structures and uh, issues with the comp model, that these I inherently generate conflicts of interest. I'm not sure I agree with that. In fact, I'm reasonably sure I don't. I think that our, our entire financial services industry can benefit from a wide range of options uh, to service a wide range of consumers. Um, there was a number of papers, uh, particularly from the uh, investor advocacy group, that made the distinction, basically said anybody who recommends a managed mutual fund is, uh, is not doing their client a good service. The only thing you should really invest in are ETFs. I don't agree with that for a number of reasons, again, but it, it starts to show patterns in, in commentary. Titles, there's a lot of debate in these, in these uh, comments about advisors' use of titles. What's a fair title that should be regulated? None of these things really tie into a fiduciary standard, but these are the issues that people were raising in their comments. Um, professionalism, advisors should be professional. I think that goes without saying. I, I, I mean, I, that's one of these things I'm not gonna disagree with at all. Advocacy is a strong so The other thing I'll mention too, if you get a chance, read the advocacy submission because it's a really good one. And that's, I'm not just sucking up because they invited me here. <laughs> and the last one that came up in almost every submission was, I, I, I put it under the category, everyone else is doing it. It's like all the cool regulators are doing this so we should do it too. And no disrespect to the CSA on that point. I really have concerns about that. Uh, Europe, the UK, Australia, all of the ones who have put into place these things or are in the process of doing so, have done so because of very, very significant issues that they had within their own financial services industries that we have not experienced to that degree in Canada. So I think you need to look at the history behind why these things were put in place in those jurisdictions and compare that to our background. Our, our structure is different here, our experience is different here. The US is looking at doing it too, the US also has concealed carry laws. I'm not sure we want those up here either. Anyway. Um, Follow the crowd, usually not a good idea. When people t tell me everybody else is doing it and we should go do it, I usually walk the other way. It's just my nature is a, a bit of a pain in the ass. Anyway, I think, I have seen no evidence of a core problem that's driving this. I really have seen none. I, uh, in my position, I see it, uh, almost all of the complaints that are levied against advisors for our companies in, at one level or another. Uh, I have seen none in 30 years that alleged breach of a fiduciary duty. They all deal with things like, and, and, and you, can, you, can pa you can do a pattern. They all sort of follow uh, financial crises. If you, all of a sudden, after 2008, a lot of the clients who thought they were high risk investors found out they weren't. They thought they could handle a decrease because they never thought they were gonna have a decrease. That doesn't necessarily mean it was bad advice, but there you go. Uh, so no, I, I don't see evidence of a core problem. There's nothing in the paper that suggests that there is either. Um, the fiduciary standard does exist in Canada. It does apply to you. It does apply to you where it should apply to you. And that test will be done by a court based on all the facts that exist in your situation. And every situation is different. You can't apply this one standard to every situation. Every client is not the same. Some clients lie. I'm, I've seen predatory clients. I've seen advisors who have been ruined because of clients who take advantage of these situations if the advisor hasn't been cautious enough in how they manage their practice. So the bottom line on all of this, I think we, there are two things, two bottom lines. One, 
if we're going to go in this direction, and I don't think anybody here disagrees with this point, if you're going to go to a fiduciary standard, it has to be qualified, it has to be clear, it has to be set up in such a way that everybody who's subject to it knows what they have to do. If there's going to be a safe harbor, and there should be for different types of practice, then you should know how to sail into that safe harbor. There's nothing in this paper that tells you anything about that. And the last point I'm going to make is a lot of the, a, a lot of the, um, the comments that I read uh, were pretty negative about advisors uh, and about the financial services industry in general, including the companies that I work for. Um, I'm against I'm against the way this thing is being implemented or is being re looked at right now, not because I think it's bad for my company. I, I actually think it's bad for Canadian investors. I have really serious concerns about the access to product for the middle market in Canada. If fiduciary standards go into place, or, or the, if these, this fiduciary duty goes into place, because it will impose costs, it will impose risk, it will impose fear. I think a lot of low-income clients are just not going to have access to advice because there's too much risk involved. That's the concern. You know, I pass it on. Sorry, probably took too long. That's all right. Thanks, Jeff. Laura. Um, so I'm going to try to incorporate what I originally had to say with some of the comments that I've heard and combine them all into one. I um, I've been following this public discussion and I've had some views on it. And what I wanted to talk about today is what I see currently as to the trends that are emerging from from this discussion. And one very clear trend that I see, and I, I heard snippets of it through what you've just heard from the panel now is, you know, the concept of best interest and fiduciary, and by the way, as a lawyer, those terms are interchangeable. When you say best interest, lawyers hear fiduciary, it, they're almost synonymous. Those concepts, I believe, are being defined in many different ways by many different people. And we are, in Canada, skipping over the definition part. We're not spending a lot of time talking about what it actually means. Because in reading through the submissions, you know, is it the cheapest product? Is it not selling proprietary products? Is it not charging commissions on a per transaction basis? Is it absolutely none of those things? Um, where Anita and I see things differently is I think as far as the courts are concerned, they're quite lucid on this com concept as to when a fiduciary duty arises. And courts see a fiduciary duty arising when you have a very dependent, vulnerable client, or when you are exercising discretion, meaning there is no client input whatsoever. The concern that I have is imposing legislation. It's not clarifying the law, it's ignoring the law. It's rewriting the law when we don't even have a working definition, and with all due respect to the CSA paper, including in the CSA paper, as to what is in the best interest of the client. So what do those words mean? What do we currently have without them? And what will we have with them? What distinguishes this situation is we're talking about a big pool of investors that come with different life circumstances and experiences and financial situations and financial goals. And we also have a very highly regulated industry. So I agree, as my profession is subject to fiduciary duties. But I can tell you the Law Society is not near, nowhere near as active um, as, as, as the SRO system is in Canada, the MFDA, IROC, the CSA. Um, there is a whole infrastructure there defining what duties are for people giving uh, retail investment advice in Canada that shouldn't be overlooked in this discussion. So with that in mind, this is what I see as the trends. There's a lot of attention being spent on, I'm going to use the word mining, mining for technical distinctions between a fiduciary standard and a suitability standard and not the same amount of time being spent at breaking down what that suitability standard actually is. And it actually includes advice beyond a buyer or sell, and it includes know your product obligations. Beyond the know your client, know your product. Um, we also spend a lot of time in this debate talking about best product. What is the best product? Is it the cheapest product? And there's statements in the CSA paper 
you know, a suitable product may not be the best product. I can't even begin to unravel that. But the fact of the matter is, we can all agree on what a good product is, sort of. You know, a good product is, a, is, a, is, issued, by, is issued by a good company and fits well between a good portfolio. But there's no one right answer as to what is the best product. There could be many very good products and you need an objective way to quantify that and it assumes there's only one. Um, with all this time being spent on the best product, there's not a lot of time being spent in public discussion on the best process. So what is the process an investment advisor goes through to know his or her client? And I'm gonna pause there based on our previous speaker. Um, he mentioned a new, a new um, survey regarding people's attitudes and behavior. And that got my attention because a lot of what I deal with in representing investment advisors and various market participants when people lose money has to do with an investor's emotional reaction to, the, to capital loss. Yes, their ability, their financial ability to afford the loss, but also their emotional reaction when that happens. So going back to, are we spending enough time on process? The know your client process and the know your, client, know your product process. Because what we seem to be agreeing on in this debate is we don't want this to turn into looking at the best outcome. In that we don't want this turning into, did the advisor recommend something that happened to have made money? And it runs a real danger of having that aspect to it at a practical implementational level. Um, because people will lose money in the market. We cannot take the risk out of the market, not even for the small investors. And we need to own that in how we implement these discussions. Um, the, the other trend that I notice is a lot of talk about conflicts of interest and managing conflicts of interest. And I find that curious because as an industry, as a highly regulated industry, there are a lot of rules in there about managing conflicts of interest already. And those rules specifically speak to the best interest of the client. So are we paying enough attention to what's already there, number one? Number two, are we assuming that the presence of a potential conflict means it will be actualized in every circumstance. So in other words, are we assuming too quickly that every investment advisor um, will do the bare minimum in every, certain, every single circumstance and nothing beyond? Are we distinguishing between the conflicts that arise between dishonest behavior, for example, an investment advisor who has a conflict because he or she has borrowed money from a client without their employer knowing about it, or has invested privately on a side business with a client, that's one conflict. Is that being distinguished from conflicts that are inherent in any industry? In other words, they do get paid for their advice. Different kinds of conflicts. Um, and I'm gonna pause here and digress slightly to the areas that I'd like to see this discussion go to if it were to continue. One, going back to the suitability standard. As, as a lawyer, I don't see how the suitability standard, which is being heavily downgraded in this discussion, is being exploited for, by investment advisors. I don't see how they can exploit their clients with a suitability standard in ways that they wouldn't with a fiduciary standard once we finally decide what on earth that means. Because unless we know what it means, we can't instruct people how to meet it or how to enforce it. Secondly, there has been some discussion about, in, and before I leave that point, I, I have to emphasize here over and over and over again that many investor disputes for small retail investors really don't go to litigation anymore uh, because we have alternative dispute resolution processes through the OBSI and other mechanisms where the idea of going to court and deciding things in, in, in accordance with legal principles only 
is really reserved for higher net worth individuals who have lost a lot of money. So this concept of a statutory duty to help the smaller investor is a misnomer. Um, with that in mind, if we were to impose it, number one, how many of investment advisors would naturally shift to higher income investors on a cost benefit analysis because of the greater liability attached to smaller accounts? But leaving that aside, um, I've heard reference to proprietary products. The other thing I can see happening if we were to proceed along this route is investment advisors making the list of products that they could recommend even shorter because the KYP obligations are being ignored. Investment advisors aren't gonna recommend more, they're gonna recommend less because of the expectations being put on them. All right, the uh, battle lines have been drawn. It's time to enter the Thunderdome. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I heard you writing basically a manuscript over there. Do you want to give any comments to what you've heard so far before I start with the first question? Well, I guess my you know, reaction is if we're going to do all this analysis that's being recommended and if the idea is that we have a majority of people who are already acting in their client's best interests. Once we sort out the definitional issues, what is the downside of putting that in writing in a statute? For the benefit not just of investor protection, but of market certainty. And that, to me, is a, remains an outstanding question. I can answer that. Um, <laughs> Please do. A, a statutory this best interest so standard means that all clients will be deemed to be vulnerable and wholly dependent on their investment advisors in all circumstances as a starting point, irrespective of what the nature of the relationship actually is and irrespective of their personal circumstances. That is your starting point all the time. But Laura, you can't, you can't say that because we just heard from Jeff that we don't know what the definition is. Now you just say, well, the definition will, will be this. No. You can't have it both ways. Will we have a definition or will we not? No. And what I'm saying is, and I agree with, no. with what Nina no, no, says, no, let's, let's not define confuse. it. Yeah, sorry, but, but you can't say that it will, ha it will mean this before we've even defined what it is. Because we're skipping over the definition part, even, even in, even in um, Anita's question. Once we get the definition worked out, that's not a minor detail. I'm talking about the impact the impact of the standard will be deemed reliance in Canadian law, because we can't just erase years of law. It is deemed reliance. Okay, so let's not skip over. Let's, let's see if we can tackle it right now. What is your definition of a fiduciary yeah, duty? I, I, I think my definition matters very little, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on, <laughs> on the side here and say, um, <laughs> what, what matters is that we have an agreed upon, working, tangible, defensible, clearly understood, clearly defined definition, and then we build it out from there. And uh, I'm, I'm not as confident as, uh, as Laura is that, that it will be deemed reliance, but it, because I think the, the thing about statute is that if you put it in the statute and you write it out and say it will, uh, what Jeff said earlier I think is a lot closer to what we think, is that it's going to be at some limited basis, and if it's limited, then we can say, well, it's limited to not be deemed reliance within these parameters. So. I think uh, what, I, what I heard from Anita is what I would also echo. We need some clarity here. The, the problem with the, the paper, even, even as written by the CSA, is that they don't define the term. And so we have uh, myriad responses uh, with uh, multiple definitions, and they all think that they're responding to the same thing, when in fact we're not really hearing each other. And it seems to me that as a matter of first principle, we should actually get a clear working definition first and foremost, and then go further. I just want to say thank you, John, for agreeing with me. <laughs> You're welcome. Can I? That was good. That was good. Yeah. Now, I didn't actually say we uh, don't have a definition for fiduciary duty. I said we don't have a definition for what best means. And best is the critical term here. And as far as I'm concerned, from reading the submissions from the investors, the investment community that bought it to write in, best means made money. It means I made money at the end of the day. And that, that's an impossible definition because you make money depending on when you sell. And if you sell in a panic, you're going to lose. And, and we all know that. My, as I said from the beginning, my biggest concern is if a fiduciary standard goes into place, you're going to have a standard that will 
push people out, advisors, out of serving the middle income. The investment standard will be fine. The guys in your position will be fine because you've already got high net worth clients and that's all good. And then you're providing an excellent service for. But I do not think that the economics of the industry are such that you're going to be able to provide that service for clients who have zero to 100,000 bucks or 50,000 or even less. And that's a huge segment of the Canadian society. And that's the segment that needs advice. So whatever model you, we wind up with, whatever definition, uh, whatever sort of, um, what do you call it, qualified definition we come up with, it has to allow that structure that we have currently in place to survive. Can I just, I, I have a, a bit of a question, I guess. The IEF has put out a stat that it found that 70% of investors believe that they are protected already by a best interest standard. Okay, so the view among the investing population seems to be, by and large, that they have a legal protection that is not currently afforded to them. So that's an argument in favor of my first point, which is greater certainty. <clears throat> but the second point is, do you not think that clients are going to be willing to bear the costs that will be imposed on them by the imposition of the duty? No, absolutely not. No question. Okay. Absolutely so, not. Once again, we have no definition. We, we, we have no way of knowing, A, whether or not there even will be a cost, or B, if there is a cost at all, what that cost will be. So how can you know for sure what that's going to be? I personally think the number is, is very close to zero, but for purposes of discussion, let's say five or ten basis points in total cost as a result of bearing the additional uncertainty and liability associated with the best interest standard. I don't think of that as being a deal breaker at all. And I think there are additional benefits that if you work with an advisor who, as a result of uh, having a fiduciary standard, doesn't take a, a commission, might charge a fee, that might be, might be deductible, which will probably get you the five or ten basis points back and then some. Um, there might be other opportunities to, uh, to have greater transparency, which has some monetary value of and by itself just because there's greater certitude. There might be just some, some room for scalability. There are a number of different things that you could get as a result of uh, as part and parcel with, with being a fiduciary. So, and I think the other thing about price is, if, if in fact my hunch is correct and the price is so nominal as to be nearly zero, I think it's preposterous that people are suggesting that uh, the middle market is going to be underserved. Look, let's hold everything constant. The advisor is the same advisor, the client is the same client, it's the same product in the same proportion, but instead of earning an embedded compensation, for instance, we could actually charge a direct fee. That's not necessarily, that's, that's the compensation. Uh, question as opposed to the fiduciary question, but I see them as being two sides of the same coin. If everything else is constant, why should the advisor compensation be constant? And why should the cost of the client be different? Everything is going to be the same. So instead of earning X number of dollars in a commission, you earn X number of dollars in, in, a, in a transparent, possibly deductible fee. But no one, absolutely no one, who is currently being served by an advisor has been priced out of the market. By definition, if they can be served under the current price structure, they can be served under the other price structure. So to that point, perhaps you could run down where you believe the extra cost would be incurred. I was just going to say, people have a choice now. And if they have the choice under your argument, everybody would be taking fee-for-service, and they aren't. The vast majority of them aren't. I mean, not the vast majority. What is it, 60%, 70% of Canadians aren't doing fee-for-service? And there's a reason for that, particularly for the, and I suspect the numbers are even higher if you just segment the population into, into uh, income bands or into asset bands. That the lower the asset band, the, the the higher percentage of people are in embedded feed structures. It's because that's what they want to pay for. The other thing I just, when I think about this, I remember back when, when the uh, GST was introduced and how many Canadians just hated the GST. And it wasn't because they had to pay tax, because they had to pay tax before when it was, the, uh, when it was at, at the, uh, the factory level. They hated seeing it. They hated calculating it. They didn't want to, it, 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 there's sort of a psychological thing about having to have that discussion. You don't want to do it, I just, I'm quite happy to have it paid for. Out of, the, out of the, my returns. But if but it's that's explained, a different thing, though, Jeff, what we're yeah, talking wait, about wait, wait, did they like it? No. Point, but did they pay it? Hell yeah, they had John, to. hold on one second. So your, your point's well taken, but however, my question was, can you give a rundown of what those extra costs would be? What, the extra compliance costs? What would generate the extra costs that the investor would have to bear? It's not so much an extra cost. What, what I'm saying is, if you changed the model and got rid of the embedded compensation model, which a lot of the arguments from the, certainly the investor advocates are in favor of that as being, if you, embedded compensation is inherently a breach of your fiduciary duty, which I would argue against, but that's the argument. Then you get rid of the embedded compensation. All you've got is fee for service. 
fee for service or direct serve yourself. So you've got high net worth clients who can afford to pay. They already are taking an advisory uh, fee for service model. You've got some clients who think they're investors, think they know what they're doing, or actually are. They're doing the online brokerage. They're doing direct self-service. You've got the vast middle market who don't know what they're doing, who are likely going to be severely prejudiced if you try to play that game. They need advice. They don't have enough money to actually warrant paying, or then they're not comfortable paying X percent of their, of their uh, portfolio to a financial advisor. A lot of Canadians are like that. Okay, so let's assume that the implementation of a fiduciary duty eliminates embedded compensation, or let's take the, uh, the situation where uh, everyone gets a, a fee-based account. So if you're under 100,000, you can get a fee-based account. What specifically would be the extra costs associated with the implementation of a fiduciary standard? I suspect the biggest, that the answer to that question will come down to how we define best. Yeah, because would, then you're gonna have to develop a compliance structure to test that. You're gonna have to develop an audit regime to be, to be able to, to validate that. KYC forms won't necessarily be specific enough. They won't, they won't do it. I mean, KYC forms are kind of CYA forms anyway. <laughs> Uh, so that's not going to do it. You're going to have to have a much more detailed structure. That's cost money. I mean, right now, in our organization, in the last 10 years, the compliance staff has gone through the roof compared to any other department of the company. And that's before the implementation? That's before, sure. yeah. That's just coming up with reaction, partly reaction to the 2008 crisis. All right. Um, question I want to throw out to the panel. Um, is there a risk that best will be boiled down to cheapest product. I know we've touched upon that, but I'd like to hear the thoughts. Anyone want to start off? Yes. Jeff? That's my answer, yes. That's it, okay. <laughs> a rebuttal on this side. <laughs> uh, John, maybe I'll direct that to you. Sure. Do you think that best necessarily means cheapest? Well, first off, I don't, I don't think it's a risk. I think it's actually a, a positive uh, outcome. So cheapest, no, but cheaper, yes. I, I think, uh, I think uh, if, if properly considered, uh, not doing so would imply that risk is that cost is immaterial, and and that's simply not the case. Uh, study after study has shown, going back you know, 35, 40 years, that cost is perhaps the most reliable determinant of of an investment outcome uh, for competing products. So to make a recommendation with no consideration to the most reliable determinant of what your outcome is going to be strikes me as being uh, perverse and, and clearly not in the client's best interest. I don't believe it need, means that it has to be the lowest cost, but I certainly think it means that cost should be part of the equation. Or did you want to? Well, you know, I, I agree that cost should form part of an advisor's recommendation. So, yes, when you're recommending various products, you should consider the cost of the product as part of your overall recommendation. Um, but that, that's been the case for many, many, many years, and I don't think the industry's disputing that at all. Um, where is the problem here? Is it that you recommended a more expensive product that didn't ultimately perform? Because, because as long as your product made money for the client, I'm not sure we're gonna have an issue. I think the real risk here is best product is gonna equal profitable product. And when it doesn't equal a profitable product, we're going to have a discussion about whether it was the cheapest product in the world that you could have recommended. Right, and just be clear, profitable to the investor. Nita? Well, I guess, let me just take it one step further and say this is something that can be dealt with in the drafting of the, of the fiduciary standard, that other jurisdictions, Australia, for example, has countered this potential problem by incorporating reasonable steps defense into its best interest standards. It's also made explicit that best is to be assessed objectively in um, ex ante. So I don't think that what I'm hearing today are in and of themselves reasons that we shouldn't be considering a standard that other professions are held to when, they're ha when they have stewardship over the livelihood of other individuals. I think the key issue, I mean, it I was a bit flippant in my response, but I still stand by it. Uh, the key issue isn't so much is, is the lowest cost going to be the end result. The key issue is when do you do the test? And if we start having, if we develop a structure that you have to do the test at the end of the day, that's a problem. Because how can you give advice that will be tested 5, 10, 15 years out during a crisis that you can't predict for? And you can't do that. 
the paper talks about, well, we shouldn't do that. But again, a lot of the commentary was all around, I don't want to lose money. I shouldn't lose money. And uh, advisors, they're smarter than I am, and they should know what they're doing, and they should only put me in something that's going to make me money. Securities law and corporate law is full of principles that direct and form the basis of our law. The public interest standard is one example. The duty of the board to act in the best interests of the corporation is another example. And simply because there's some ambiguity in how this principle will play out in each and every case, in my mind, doesn't mean that we should be shying away from it. Securities law has not shied away from those types of standards to date. And it seems to me to be wholly inconsistent to say, well, we don't know how it's going to play out, we don't know what the costs are going to be, and we shouldn't be there for considering it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you measure it at the end of the day. If that's the test, that's a wrong test. No, but, but she said that the test is, is applied ex ante, right, before you even buy the product. So whatever happens after the point of sale is, is not even part of the consideration. The, the question is, because advisors are not being held to a standard of being presumptively clairvoyant. It's not as though anyone can know. And by the way, high cost products and low cost products can both go down in, in, a, in a dropping market. So it's not as though there's not liability irrespective of which product you chose on the basis of cost. You're still liability. So, uh, but the ex ante uh, argument I think is the important thing to, to uh, bear in mind here is that did the advisor make a recommendation that, at, well, let's, let's put it this way, not knowing what the future holds seemed to be in the client's best interest at the point of making the recommendation. And if that can be deemed to be, uh, have, have been done, we're fine, move on. Nothing to deemed, see here. But, excuse me, deemed by whom? So Anita's mentioned, Anita's mentioned securities laws and she's made reference a few times to directors and officers and their fiduciary obligations. Those fiduciary obligations, and what that is is, if there's, there's statute, um, the Canada Business Corporations Act, the Ontario Business Corporations Act say directors must act in the best interest of the corporation. So remember, best interest means fiduciary to lawyers. Yes, but that is further qualified in the statute and further amplified by case law. And in a nutshell, the courts have held, we will give them deference, uh, we will give deference to the business judgment rule. If they can sh reasonably show that they had good process and that they were responsibly exercising their business judgment, we will not intervene. Um, at a practical level, I, I, don't, I don't think we can say that that, is being, that will be implemented at the retail investor level for small accounts. Number one, is it a court that's looking at it? Number two, is that the analysis? Um, are, are, those, are those the principles that will apply? Um, remember, they don't, they don't go to court. Um, there's been no talk of what else would be in the statute. And, and the, other, the other part of this is we're talking as if this statute is coming in to fill a hole because the duties of investment advisors aren't otherwise defined. They couldn't be more defined. We have so many duties of investment advisors. We have rules. We have guidance notices apart from the law. What about those? So when we're asking investors, do you believe that your investors should act in their best interest? It's, it's in many ways a meaningless question because we're not telling them first, these are the duties that your investment, investment advisor already has to you. We're not informing the question. We're not defining best interest. You will get the same answer if you ask investment advisors. It's a, a question that has a lot of form, but not a lot of meat. So I, on that point, just before you get before I pass it over to you, Anita, I just wanted to respond to something that was said earlier. I think you said it. It was the, uh, I think it's the expectation gap between investors and advisors. That investors think, some 80% of them think that the client, advisors have their best interests at heart or give advice in their own best interest. And some large percentage of, uh, just judging from what we had today, some large percentage of advisors feel the same thing. I, I am not sure that when you ask the question, of, of individual Canadians. Do you think your advisor has your best interests at heart? That they are thinking of this in a legalistic stand, uh, from a fiduciary standpoint. They're thinking of it, is my advisor thinking about me? Is he actually giving advice that he thinks is gonna be best for me, given my circumstances? That actually is the standard. That's the standard that advisors are held to, under all the rules that apply. And, that, that, and frankly, to, to jump to a question that comes later, that's the standard for insurance as much as it is for, uh, for securities. So we've already got this in place. I think the part of the problem is, I really think part of the problem here is the terminology that we're using. 
We're using best, best, best interest. And we're interpreting it as lawyers, the three of us, uh, as being the fiduciary duty standard, which is a fairly significant change to the role between advisors and clients. And it's certainly, I think, a big shift in the, uh, the burden. It's putting all the clients in one box. All clients are suddenly vulnerable clients who need protection from predatory advisors. And I just don't think that's true. So I think part of the issue that we're dealing with here is terminology. If we all had the same words, we'd probably not disagree that much. Did you so, want to respond to that? Well, I, I, I think that we should be aiming for clarification on terminology. That's what lawyers make their bread and butter from. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, um, you know, when I'm teaching securities law to my students, I start out with Section 1.1 of the Ontario Securities Act. And I'm, I'm not taking the side of investors or issuers or dealers when I'm teaching, but I say the role of securities regulation has traditionally been investor protection. That's what Section 1.1 of the Act says. And when I'm advocating for a best interest standard, I'm doing it not because I feel, not only because I feel that it's the right thing for investors, but it is the obligation of the securities regulator to pass legislation that is in investors' interest. So if the regulator is not going to um, move towards a best interest or fiduciary duty standard, I do agree with Laura, we do agree on something, <laughs> that for lawyers they do mean the same thing. <laughs> is with this in mind that I, I'd like to hear an explanation from the regulator why they're not, why they're not implementing it, uh, a fiduciary duty for invest. That actually leads me to my next uh, question for each of the panelists, which is I just want a very short yes, no, I don't know answer. Uh, do you think that a fiduciary duty is inevitable? John? Inevitable is a long time. Yes. Anita? No. Laura? I hope not. It would be irresponsible. <laughs> Jeff? I want to say a short answer. <laughs> 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 but it's, it's, a, it's a hard one. I, I think we've already got all of the fundamentals of a fiduciary duty now. So the answer to your question is we've already got it where we need it. Interesting. Can, can May I, I respond to Please. <laughs> well, if we already have it, put it in the statute. <laughs> no, where we need no, it. No, where we need it. We've got it. Where clients need protection, it's there. It's been built up they, over hundreds of years. They're assuming they have their interest protected by a fiduciary duty standard, as far as the IEF says, in any case, um, with the 70% stat, but they don't. So to me, there's a gap. No, they're assuming that their advisors are make, are, have their best interests. It doesn't mean that they're assuming they have this fiduciary standard. That's the difference. Again, so it's language. They don't understand the question. And whether they understand it or not doesn't necessarily mean, just because every, just opinion poll tells you you should do this, doesn't mean you should do it. I reject the premise of what Jeff said, that we have it where we need it. I don't believe we do have it where we need it. I believe that we, we need it for small accounts and that there are a lot of small accounts that are in products, for instance, that cost too much, that could very easily be substituted out and the savings passed on to the client. Uh, and I think that's the sort of thing where um, it would be the sort of thing where a fiduciary standard would, depending on what the ultimate definition turns out to be, would likely provide certitude and clarity and protect the consumers better than is currently this case. What I find interesting is that we have two people on each side of this discussion talking about what we each believe is in the client's best interest. And I was at the original meeting for Advocates when it was created with the merger of CAFA and the CAFP in St. John's, Newfoundland in 2003, 2004. I remember Brian, Ballard, Brian Mallard and, and uh, Jim Rogers talking about how we were gonna be moving forward and, and uh, uh, this is gonna be a combination of advocacy and advice and that we're gonna be professional. So I find it ironic that uh, the panel after this one is gonna be talking about a professional standard even though Brian and Jim were talking about raising the bar for the professional standard a decade ago, and yet here we're having this discussion after this panel's over. And I find it interesting that we're having this discussion about what the client's best interest are, is, because this is an organization, advocates, that is supposed to be engaged in advocacy, 
advocacy presumably for clients and advice. And yet there is no clear consensus at this point that I can tell as to what is in the client's best interest. I absolutely believe that a fiduciary best uh, standard would be in the client's best interest. And I find it perverse that there are people here in advocates that would disagree with me. Well, I disagree with it too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean it's frankly, hard to, to believe in a standard you can't define. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> That's part of it. The other part of it is, frankly, I, th I don't think that the concerns that we're expressing on this end of the table are, are just false, made up worries to fear monger. I think they're real concerns based on uncertainty and a and la complete lack of clarity in this debate. I think if you're talking about coming up with a rule change that imposes fiduciary duties across the board for all client relationships, no matter what the real facts of the situation are. You think, and you think that's protecting investor interests, when in fact what the end result of that could be the elimination of advice services for the middle market in Canada, I think you're mistaken. I think you're eliminating investor protection. I think that's the biggest concern. And I haven't seen enough debate around that. I haven't seen enough evidence to say that that's wrong. That's a real concern. And it, it's kind of like the nuclear option. I mean, if it's a, and actuaries all talk about the 99th quintile and all that stuff. It, it may never happen, but if it does, it's terrible. <laughs> that, I think this kind of falls into that category. So if we're gonna go this route, then really a lot more work has to be done rather than just this paper. And frankly, other than the advocates paper and the one that we wrote, uh, you know, there's a lot of less than stellar uh, commentary on this. Now, uh, on this side, you've stated that the fiduciary duty essentially exists where it needs to be today. So, is there a possibility of formalizing it where it needs to be formalized today? Would you have an issue with that? It is already formalized where it needs to be formalized. Today. And where is that specifically? In the case law. Well, because you can't, you can't have a uniform statute, statutory standard in this industry that applies to everybody. That's the problem. You cannot have three sentences that apply invariably to the multiple forms of relationships that can exist. So you are, you are stuck with a fact-based approach because the facts are always different. It is formalized. But I mean, in many instances, what we are having is a false debate because there's many instances where, where we agree. Of course we agree on the professionalism of those giving investment advice. Of course we agree they should be held to high standards. Of course we agree that costs should be reasonable and part of the investment advice. Of course we believe on um, performance reporting. I, I mean, there's, there's a lot that we agree on. It's just be cautious of extreme unnecessary positions. Okay, and at this point we're about to enter the Q&A phase, so if anyone does have questions that they want to submit, please write it down and staff will bring it over. Uh, and as I'm getting those questions, I'll leave one last question um, for this part of the discussion. Uh, and that is, and you've touched upon it, Jeff, how would a statutory best interest duty on the security side square with the insurance sector's utmost good faith standard, since consumers often deal with one advisor at their point of sale uh, for both securities and insurance products? Anita? Well, I think there, that, that's a key question in my mind. It would be very, very difficult to, to sync those. There's already an existing, um, you know, standard, and we don't have it on the other side, and so we're going to have to ha do some, that's where I think some of the hard thinking is going to have to come. I, I mean, I'm in the insurance industry. Um, I don't see any difference between the two standards that currently exist. They're exactly the same. There is no difference. And both, both standards, now, there's a difference between having a standard and enforcing the standard. There's a difference between having, like the Russian constitution, most beautiful constitution, fairest one in the world. Soviet constitution, sorry. But in practice, it didn't really work very well. Uh, same thing here, if you could have the, great, the best rules in the world, the best standards, and uh, we have, all, have them throughout both, both industries, if they're not enforced, that's a problem. That's a problem no matter what. So I think, there is some room for improved enforcement, without question. We also have good faith language in securities legislation already. And the difference, I mean, this is why in some, we, we, we're having an esoteric academic debate in many regards. The legal definition between good faith and best interest is good faith recognizes that there is a commercial reality that you're paid for, but you must do the right thing. Best interest at law is you are not to have any regard 
to any commerce. Ha, ha. Okay, <laughs> that's what we're arguing about. So that's why I mean, this, this conversation needs to have airs of reality to it and we need to move away from words. Can I just make um, one point about the whole thing, the common law, the case law takes care of best interests. And that's, that is an argument that's made quite frequently um, by those who believe we don't need to implement um, a fiduciary duty. And I come back to the mandate of the securities regulator. The securities regulator's role is investor protection. Whether or not the case law is doing the job or has set down the standard is not, in my mind, sufficient. The case law emanates from an, an ex post examination of the facts. It is not an ex ante standard that guides behavior in the first instance. That's the difference between case law and statute. So which securities regulator are you referring to? We have many of them. True. Um, and those that are responsible for the distribution of retail advice, I'm suggesting, have done a very good job of informing that standard. Are you referring to the CSA, the OSC? The CSA has no um, mandatory powers. It has no ability unless individual jurisdictions implement, implement the legislation to impose it. So mm -hmm. definitely not talking about the CSA. Um, individual securities regulators is who I'm talking about right now. And so in my mind, case law and courts can continue to do what it has, which is to examine cases after the fact and decide whether a fiduciary duty um, exists in this circumstance. What John and I are talking about here is something completely different from that ex post analysis. And, and so am I. What I'm, yeah. and I want to be specific about securities regulators. Provincial regulators and SROs, um, they all have their domains and their overlaps. So if we're saying securities regulators aren't doing the job, where? And this is an example of where we say, where I say the debate is lacking. Are we taking a close look at the job that's actually being done and by which regulators? Now, I want to uh, focus the attention to some of the questions. There are a lot. Uh, I'm going to cover as many as I can. Uh, first one, um, John says some clients are on products that cost too much, but does this not violate the principles of suitability and the duty to act honestly, fairly, and in good faith? In my opinion, unfortunately, no. I wish it did. Uh, my sense of uh, fairly honestly in good faith is one of does it meet the, the, the tests that set out in the NCAF in terms of tolerance for risk, time horizon, and so forth. And there's nothing on an NCAF that I've ever seen that makes reference to cost. Anyone want to dispute that? Have a different point? I, would, I would say that any advisor who doesn't take cost into consideration when they're doing an analysis for their client is taking this pretty significant risk. So, so would I, and I think they've been held to that standard for many years. Yeah. I don't think there's any question on that. Now, that doesn't mean that an advisor who's got a proprietary shelf and has a choice of X number of funds to, to make their selection from has to go outside of that shelf and look uh, and, and just basically, well, some of the submissions said, just recommend ETFs. That's not what it means. It means within the, the universe that you've got to work from, and every one of us in this room, every one of us, I don't, I'm not an advisor, every one of you in this room has a limited universe to work from. Uh, within that universe, you make the choice that makes the most sense, and you should take pricing into account. But you just gave vertically integrated firms a get-out-of-jail-free card. You've just said, if you only have in-house products that you can recommend, and those happen to be expensive products, well, then you're okay to recommend them because that's all you have on your shelf. And I disagree. I think you should, you should actually be recommending the lower-cost product, and having only the in-house brand on the shelf uh, doesn't, doesn't exonerate you from, uh, from that obligation. Okay, and in the interest of all these questions, I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, the CSA said that the fiduciary duty could be a point-in-time duty that applies only when interacting one, with an advisor. Is this realistic, or does the duty have to be continuous given that the markets change every day? How can an advisor with hundreds of clients possibly deal with this? They can't. I mean, they can't. Simple as that. You've got, a hundred, you've got hundreds of clients. Every one of them has a different reaction to the way the market's going to move in a given day. And everyone's going to have a different reaction to whatever the financial news of the day is. And you're going to have to call them up and coach them through that moment. You can't. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. I agree with that. I actually agree that you, it's very, very difficult to isolate a particular t moment in time when something as pervasive 
as a fiduciary duty is being discussed. And that's why we have this case law in the lawyer-client relationship where the Supreme Court has said that that duty cannot be isolated to a particular point in time. It, in fact, extends beyond the end of the formal relationship. I agree. Yeah, but just current duties of investment advisors are not a point in time. They are ongoing duties. So what is impossible and what is unfair is currently being implemented as we speak and again, had been for some years. At a practical level, it's not the words, it's how we use them and how we apply them to everyday life. Advisors are, at some level, expected to do that from, to, to avoid civil liability um, and to meet their regulatory obligations. So it already exists. Next question, isn't there a risk that a fiduciary duty being the highest standard of care in law will end up being a hammer used to inflate the quantum of damages resulting from a claim? Well, as with the previous question about inevitability, uh, it, it's, you make it sound like it's an absolute. Uh, is, is there a possibility? Yes. Lay odds, it rounds to zero. So, yeah, it could happen, but I would be very surprised. And I would add to that, you know, I heard a similar concern when we were talking in securities law about the imposition of liability for continuous disclosure misrepresentations. That as soon as there was going to be a liability for that, that the damages were going to be you know, running very, very high. And the way the statute has dealt with that, and I thought in a very good way, is to create <coughs> some defenses to liability and liability caps. And so these are logistical issues, and they're real issues, but they can be dealt with um, in the drafting of the legislation. What a breach of a fiduciary duty does is it limits, if not negates, any investor responsibility. That's it in a nutshell. So as far as contributory negligence or discounting damages because of the investor's role, when you're talking fiduciary duty, you take that out of the picture because, again, deemed reliance. So I don't know how we can carve that out by re without rewriting the law, which is what we're talking about, but that's why there's a concern over the language. I agree with her. <laughs> <laughs> If a fiduciary duty is not implemented, what alternatives should the CSA pursue? You keep doing what you do. CRM2 is just rolling out. Let's see how that works. Let's take a look at what happens in the UK and Australia and Europe and the United States. I mean, this is a perfect opportunity. You can see what's going on in these other jurisdictions and see how they go to hell in a handbasket or don't. Let's learn from their experiences and not at the expense of the Canadian public. May I respond to that? Please. I like this crowd. So, so <laughs> j judging by your applause, uh, do I take your applause to mean if things don't go to hell in a handbasket that you'd be all in favor of a fiduciary standard? No. Wait, wait a minute. You just said if they don't go to hell. <laughs> you just said it's not you don't want it to go to hell, and let's just make sure it doesn't go to hell. So it doesn't go to hell, then can we do this? It doesn't mean it's broken now. Mm -hmm. Ah, so I heard someone say it doesn't mean it's broken right now. Okay, so... If, if you don't know if it's broken right now, do people in this house, here, in, this, in this room here sell insurance? Do people in this room have insurance on their house in case it burns down? Do you want your house to burn down? Because it ain't broken now, right? So we only need insurance in case the house burns down. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You need insurance in case it breaks. You don't want to wait until after it breaks to fix the problem. You buy the insurance before the house burns down. But you want to be sure there's a problem first. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait. My, my house is totally insulated. It's as, it's as uninflammable as any house around, but I have insurance on it. So I've done everything I can to mitigate risk, but I still, not because I expect a fire, not because I want a fire, but because I want to mitigate against it. Well, then the best solution is just to uh, upgrade the CPP and eliminate financial advice for the middle market. Well, can, can I just answer the question? Mm -hmm. The question is, would you like to see any other reform? And I addressed that right at the beginning of my remarks, which is the law needs to be clarified. Each and every one of us in this room and on this panel have indicated some lack of clarity in the current, even the definitions that we're tossing around, fiduciary duty, best interests, et cetera. I think the regulators have a role to step up and tell us 
what the law is. If it's reiterating current law, that may not be my preference, but I think that's high time that that's done. The debate's gone on long enough. When I started chairing the investor advisory panel in 2010, we were arguing that the OSC needs to clarify the law. And I continue to make that same comment in 2013. And I think on that note, because we have, there's no way we can address the rest of these questions <laughs> in 30 seconds. We'll call it there and I'll thank the panelists very much for your uh, time and your presentation.